innovation. It's a word we hear a lot in the health and life sciences ecosystem, and you won't find a corner of the market more in tune with innovation than bioanalytical labs, the organizations at the forefront of testing how tomorrow's precision therapies actually work. Today on Industry Icons, Dr. Chad Briscoe of Solarion discusses how bioanalytical labs are growing to unlock the next frontiers in medical diagnostics and therapies. Hi, and welcome to this edition of Industry Icons. I'm Jason Burke, Chief Strategy Officer here at CREO, and this is the place where we talk with life sciences and healthcare leaders about how these organizations are growing and innovating to create a better, healthier world. Today, I am thrilled to be sitting down with Dr. Chad Briscoe. Chad has been one of the leading figures in bioanalytical laboratories for many years. He currently leads bioanalytical services for Solarion, one of the top contract research organizations in the world. And he's joined us here today in Creo's offices to talk about the amazing science and technology behind bioanalytical labs and the medical innovations they empower. Chad, welcome to the show and thanks so much for being here. Well, th thanks a lot, Jason. I'm excited to be a guest on Industry Icons today. So, Chad, for people whose only experience with labs, medically oriented labs, may be when their doctor asks them during their annual physical for a blood sample to check their cholesterol, can you just describe briefly, what's a bioanalytical lab and how is it different than, say, a lab that someone might be uh, sending their, uh, their routine medical test to? Yeah, so uh, the, the easiest way to probably cut, cut the difference between the two types of laboratories, one, one we would probably typically call a clinical laboratory, which would be analyzing your samples for your healthcare and for healthcare related needs. And then you have a bioanalytical laboratory, which typically we're going to be analyzing samples that are a result of clinical trials. So we work in the drug development space. A lot of the tests might overlap and be similar, but there's actually different regulations as well that, uh, that we follow versus what the, what the clinical labs follow. And so those, those tests that are being used, it sounds like primarily for research, um, is there more diversity in those kinds of tests? I would think that there might not be quite as many standards as maybe a typical diabetes panel, for example. That's right. The, the clinical laboratories would have generally standardized tests that they would develop because they're going to assay those. Uh, they're going to run those tests over the maybe millions of, of, uh, of people you can imagine. Uh, or if you think of the COVID, it was uh, COVID testing was over billions of people. Uh, whereas the uh, tests that we do, sometimes uh, if they're in the drug development space, they might be used uh, maybe as few as a, as a handful of time up to uh, more in the thousands of times uh, over the course of the development of a drug. Uh, it, it may be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, but it's, but it's not millions and it's certainly not billions. So the bioanalytic lab market, it's been growing at a pretty healthy pace over the past few years, I think. And, and some people may look at that and say, well, that's kind of an artifact of COVID-19 and, and the rise in, in testing that really the whole world had to kind of go through. But this market was actually growing before COVID got here, right? Like, give us a sense of why is bioanalysis becoming such an important part of the way that we develop medical therapies? Yeah, so, uh, so it, it has grown. I've been in this space for 27 years. My entire career, I've been in, in bioanalysis, and, and we've seen anywhere from 10 to 20% growth in that space over that, uh, over that time. And there have been a number of different factors and reasons for that. In the uh, contracting and outsourcing space, uh, it can be uh, due to pharmaceutical companies sending more of their work out versus doing it internally. Uh, it also has to do with the simple growth in drug development. So there's more drugs being developed now than ever before, and therefore you need more clinical trials, and therefore you have more testing. Uh, but also the type of testing we're doing is getting more complex and more diverse. Uh, when I started in, in bioanalytical, there was really... Oh, there's really only one or two kinds of tests that we would do in our lab at any one time. We'd, we'd do a pharmacokinetic testing using LCMS, or, or even before that, it would be just simple HPLC testing. Uh, and now if we look across uh, a typical bioanalytical laboratory, uh, they're going to they're gonna cut across, uh, I don't even know how many I would count. I mean, it'd be five or 10 types of tests across 
uh, maybe five or 10 different types of techniques and technologies and tools. And, and, uh, and so it's just uh, over that time, it's uh, ex- grown exponentially. And do, does that growth in testing, does that also imply kind of a greater precision approach to the way that we're developing the therapies themselves? Yeah, I'd say uh, there's two ways we could think of the precision in that term again. So you could say the tests themselves are more precise. Mm-hmm. I mentioned that we started doing LCMSMS. Uh, uh, well, beginning of my career really was kind of the birth of the LCMSMS in the mid 90s. Uh, and the tests for that are certainly much more precise and the results are much more precise. But also the answers we're looking for, we can get a more precise answer. Uh, we do more different types of tests. Mm-hmm because we want to get a more complete picture of the disease. So, you know, in addition to this kind of natural organic growth that we see Mm -hmm. happening in in the space, and and you've talked about kind of the scaling up of of pharmaceutical development Mm -hmm. and and just growing R&D spin there, there's also a lot of inorganic growth happening in the bioanalytical space as well, right? Companies are buying other companies and merging and um, and it seems I'm guessing the kind of the approach there is they they want to expand their geographic footprint and or they want to expand maybe the the types of tests and services right. that they offer or maybe grow their their capacity. How, how do you see that market evolving over the next five years and where will where are bioanalytical labs likely to see kind of the most competition? Yeah, so uh, you hit on some of the key key points of why uh, why we grow inorganically. Uh, so so acquisitions can be a quick way to uh, build a technique, but also a lot of times it's about buying uh, expertise. Uh, it's about uh, buying geographical space. So uh, nearly every bioanalytical lab I could probably think of, it started with uh, one expert who wanted to start his lab, and quite. Quite often, that expert had an area that they specialized in, and so uh, as you'd expect, they they grow the lab and they uh, have a particular expertise, or they're taking advantage of a specific geography uh, where where there's a need for bioanalytical testing, and and that could be a specific area in the United States or in Europe, or it can be in Australia or in or in China, other parts of Asia, uh, and and the techniques can be anything from. Uh, expertise in, I'll, I'll go back to LCMS because that's, again, that's my uh, my background, but it could be somebody who had an expertise in LCMS and and started up a lab, or it could be a specialized biomarker or or, uh, or some other technology. And so as, as labs have had to grow out of the uh, one-dimensional space or the more limited uh, space that they started in, uh, a lot of times, instead of trying to find local experts and, and build that on, they'll go out and they'll find a laboratory that, uh, that meets their needs. I don't expect that to slow down. I think, uh, I think every, I don't know if it's every bioanalytical lab, but I think many bioanalytical labs are looking at where, where do they grow and what sorts of technologies uh, might they add. And there's always that question, do I, do I build it right here and uh, in the lab where I'm currently have staff or do I go out and find it and buy it or do I um, do I do I find some other way to, to add that uh, add that technology so as long as as long as the space is expanding which I don't think anyone thinks it's going to stop we're going to continue to see that uh, that type of growth and so how does that play out in terms of a laboratory's operation so when when things are growing really really fast I would think it's it's difficult to kind of figure out how to how to effectively scale up operations to meet that demand? Tell me, tell me a little bit about what that looks like for bioanalytical labs, and why is that difficult or challenging? When labs are built, they're built again by quite often one particular expert, or maybe it's a handful of experts who can manage and know uh, every aspect of the lab. They know every study. They know every drug being analyzed. They know uh, they know all the different tests that are being done. But you get to a point. Uh, and I think it's maybe when you get to around 50 staff, but certainly when you start approaching 100 staff where no one person can know every study and every customer that's going on. And so you really have to find a way to scale. And and uh, we see a lot of labs sort of stall out around 100 uh, staff. And that, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, that's a point where I think you need to make a decision. Again, I'd say in that 50 to 100 person range, you need to make a decision. Do I do I go for another site for my growth or do I maybe split the lab and manage it separately? Maybe we're now managing it by the two different types of technologies or, or do we scale it in a, in a different way? 
And I'm, and I'm taking away from part of what you're saying that one of the critical success factors is just having the right talent to be able to grow right. the, the lab. I think I was reading Absolutely. somewhere that the lab as a market sector actually uh, is, uh, is short of skilled talent to be able to fill all of the demand. Are you seeing that as well? We are, and I, I think you see it. Uh, you see it everywhere, and you see it in different ways. Uh, some geographies have loads of of talent. Uh, because they have maybe a big infrastructure of pharmaceuticals, but then you have high competition for talent and high salaries. And, and, and in other areas, you, uh, you may not have as many uh, geographically, you don't, just don't have as many people, uh, but the talent that comes tends to stay, but maybe you need to develop it internally. Actually, one of the things we're doing uh, at Solarion is we're trying to partner with some of the universities to either provide our expertise to help them in that training or provide internship opportunities so the staff, while they're in school, uh, can, can work in the lab and also get some different types of differentiated expertise so they come out uh, more well-trained, so they come out of school well-trained well in, the, in the first place. I also think if you can work a bit more in your field while you're doing school, that, that uh, what you learn is simply going to be more applied, right? You're going to be able to apply it, and then it's all going to make more sense. And I think you're going to you're going to put it all together instead of separating your book learning, and then later on you come into the lab and you're not not being asked to think as much right away. You're being asked to pipette and learn procedures and and things like that. So I hope it makes a more complete scientist in the end. Well, and going back to some of the comments that you were making earlier, I would think part of the the skill alignment activity in terms of the resources in the lab is uh, reflected in the fact that the there's this ongoing stream of innovations that are constantly impacting the space. So, so you've, as you were saying earlier, you've got kind of new products, right. pharmaceutical products uh, that are, are uh, coming around. You also have new tests and new approaches for, uh, for analyzing things. Right. So it, I would think the the resource pool really needs to to be able to to learn and adapt quickly to uh, this kind of ongoing stream of new. That's for sure. And so we're always looking at the staff as to who who wants to to keep in their area specialty and grow and and uh, and, and just stay on that track. But then there's always folks that that want to divert and learn something new, right? So as we think about uh, cell and gene therapies, that are of course one of the hot areas in pharmaceutical development. That's driven uh, a lot more uh, PCR, right? D DNA, RNA testing in the laboratories. It's, it's driven a lot more flow cytometry in bioanalytical. It's driven uh, techniques like ELISPOT uh, in the bioanalytical laboratories. Those are all new uh, over the last uh, even three to five years. They're quite new in bioanalytical labs. So you, you, you can take somebody who's been doing mass spectrometry or even ELISA's for, for 10, 20 years, and you can train them in this new technique. Uh, some people want to do that. Some people aren't interested. Uh, and then, or, or you can hire somebody in that has that expertise or Going back to what we were talking about earlier with acquisitions, you might say, geez, flow cytometry, I'm not sure we want to build that here. Maybe we can go out and we can find a company that, uh, that will buy that, uh, buy that expertise and buy a, buy a lab that's been doing it uh, for, for longer than we have. So how do you think about kind of the, the big innovation areas that are going to be, you know, kind of defining the market over the next few years. Um, it seems like the the landscape is ripe with opportunity. Are there are there a few areas that you feel like are, are really going to have a, a you know a strongly determining uh, impact in terms of the way bioanalytical labs are, are thinking and operating and innovating? Yeah, with, without a doubt, there's uh, there's a few, and I'm sure I'm gonna I'm sure I'm gonna miss some when I talk about it. But when I when I look back at my career in in bioanalytical, the the earlier part of the 2000s, there was a lot of regulatory, uh, I'll, I don't even want to call it innovation, but there's a lot of new regulatory rules. And we did need to innovate in a lot of our processes in order to uh, be able to be efficient and, and, and follow the new regulations. And I think that's great. And I think it was a really important time. But uh, if you go to school to be a scientist, it can kind of get boring to, uh, to be focused on how do I write new SOPs and, and procedures. And, I, and then the, the 2010s, we saw an explosion in, in biotech drugs with antibody therapeutics and, and other protein molecules. And that's just, 
it's really started to steamroll into all sorts of new modalities, uh, cell and gene therapies, but cell and gene therapies is not, uh, it, it's a multidimensional uh, uh, space in itself, right? E even just in cell and gene, cell and gene are, are very different. And within each of those technologies or within each of those modalities, uh, there's, there's different types of analyses that are included in all of that. And, and, uh, literally every week, certainly every month, we see another customer who's got another, uh, another drug in development from a different, a different type of way to go about it. And so we have to, uh, we have to apply the technologies we know, but we're always thinking about adding new technologies and new techniques or just a new twist on, on what was in the past. So, uh, I'm so excited to be in the bioanalytical space because I don't see that stopping. I'm excited to see the innovation. It, uh, I'm a scientist first and foremost, uh, you know, more more than a more than a businessman, and so I I I, I get jazzed by the science. It makes it yeah. fun coming it to work, does. right? It makes it fun coming <laughs> to work. Absolutely. So you mentioned the um, the regulatory landscape mm -hmm. here, and it, and. It, seems like you can't really have a conversation in life sciences without also yeah. talking about the regulatory implications. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, you know, what strikes me is that, uh, you know, how well, how well can the regulatory landscape keep pace with the pace of innovation that's kind of happening in the space? And well, how do you see that landscape changing in light of the, the pace of innovation? What are companies uh, that are, are you know, in, sitting in this growth space, what do they need to be thinking about uh, from a regulatory perspective? So, yeah, so innovation is is always going to be outpacing what the regulatory bodies can do. It's by nature, they're not going to put in new regulations until a technology has moved along. So there's a few things that we need to do there. I think one of the things we're doing well now in the bioanalytical space is we're we're thinking ahead okay how can we take the regulations we already know and the objectives of those regulations and apply it to new technologies uh, one example again is uh, is qpcr so uh, we've started doing a, a lot of qpcr in bioanalytical labs and so the challenge then that we faced was there's no bioanalytical guidance for how to do a qpcr test and so uh, there's a number of groups that have come together and they're interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary, but well, mostly bioanalytical, but across companies, across uh, the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists, across the European Bioanalytical Forum and these different groups that are saying, hey, we're taking people from different companies to find the best way to solve these, uh, what I like to say, these, these problems that are in the non-competitive space. None of, none of us really, we're gonna compete on who can have the best assay and the best customer service. I don't think any of us wanna compete on who can be the most compliant, right? That's, <laughs> it, we all wanna be compliant. We wanna give everybody the option, to, the opportunity to, to do that. And that's, and that's really important to the consumer as well because the high quality data being generated across all the labs is simply going to lead to to better drugs, safer drugs if we can if we can implement that uh, that sort of approach. So so you're leading bioanalytical services now for Solarion, which is uh, one of the world's leading contract research organizations. Tell me what attracted you to their their mission and the work that they're doing. Yeah, so I have a long history with uh, Solarion actually. So I worked for 13 years for the predecessor uh, company to Solarion from 1997 to 2010. And, uh, and so for me, uh, it's not as much a Solarion answer for part of it. It was, I really wanted to come back to, um, an area that I knew pretty well, but the opportunity was also right. And the company was right. And that, and that was uh, key as well. So, uh, Solarion's focus is really to think of taking drugs from, uh, discovery to proof of concept, right? And so that discovery piece comes in more in our bioanalytical services, where we where we start with the most with the earliest regulated studies, and then we have a strong emphasis on phase one um, uh, phase one uh, trials uh, uh, partnered with the bioanalytical. And what's interesting about what Solarion is doing is we're we're trying to answer questions uh, together, right? Uh, if you're only a bioanalytical lab, say, or if you're doing this in a, in a vacuum as a, as a phase one unit or a clinical unit, and you're not working in tandem with your partners, then you're only telling half the story. And at Solarion, 
everything we do, we're talking to our partners and most of the studies we do uh, are in conjunction between our bioanalytical and our um, and our clinical partners. And so I, I think, again, when we talk about needing to answer these uh, richer, more difficult questions, if, if I can call up uh, my counterpart that's running the, the clinic, uh, you know, Phil Bach or Michelle Combs, who's running our, uh, our pharmacokinetics and, and, uh, and biostats group and ask them the questions about the data and the way that we're assessing the data, then we're going to be able to give our customers uh, a better solution to the uh, than the study that they might have proposed to us. So, uh, so last year, 2022, uh, Solarion had several expansions right. of their service offerings, very consistent with I think yeah. the conversation we've been having uh, so far. I think they made some investments in immune monitoring and biomarker screening and um, ADME mm -hmm. capabilities, which you might want to explain what those sure. are. But what, yeah. what do those investments tell us about the future direction of, of clinical research and then bioanalysis yeah. in terms of its support of that? Yeah, so there's a there's a different story with each one of those things you might bring up, but uh, but there's definitely some themes that run throughout it. And one of them you didn't bring up is that the uh, the phase one clinic in Phoenix uh, for Solarion actually had a tremendous uh, expansion last year as well. And so that that just kind of tells you where the phase one space is going, and it's still growing, right? And there's and there's more trials in that space. But uh, when we think about how the different services grow, again, I mentioned it, but we talk about growing in tandem and growing in ways that, uh, that either uh, grow with the clinics or grow uh, with the technology. So if you think about uh, an increase in immune monitoring, uh, simply an increase in, in capacity uh, and things like that, those are, uh, those are tied to just simply market growth. Uh, but also, if I think about the immune monitoring that's, uh, and, and the addition of uh, cell and molecular biology, those those growths are very much tied to the growth in cell and gene therapy in the industry and and responding to that and and uh, uh, but if you look at something like our ADME services so ADME is uh, the uh, uh, adsorption distribution and metabolism and excretion right so essentially it's really looking in detail at what happens to that drug when you take it uh, so uh, we might uh, measure just a concentration in a really simple study, but in an ADME study, we want to know where does that go? What tissues is it, uh, is it distributing into? How is it being excreted, excreted from the body? So is it the liver? Is it the, is it the, uh, are the kidneys pa you know, processing it, passing it through urine? So there's all sorts of questions that might be asked. Uh, one of the things that Solarion is a, is a leader on in this space is looking at mass balance studies. So uh, those are often radio labeled studies with a very uh, low dose of radioactivity where we look at uh, what is happening to that radioactive tracer as it goes through the body. And then we can do the analysis subsequently on those samples mm -hmm. and we can understand again the full ADME picture, the adsorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion of that drug as it, uh, as it passes through the body. So, uh, so we built out our capabilities uh, to support the ADME studies that were going on in our clinics. That's, a, that's actually been a specialty of Solarion for many, uh, for many, many years, back to when I first started in the, in the late 90s, we were doing ADME studies. But last year, we made a significant advancement through acquisition of, of high-resolution mass spectrometry. Uh, we have three uh, industry leaders uh, in that space that, uh, that, that we brought on board that are supporting the, the analysis side of that, uh, of that as well. One of the things that in hearing you talk about that and, and as we were thinking about the kind of the growth and scale up mm -hmm. trajectories uh, earlier, one of the things that strikes me is what's the role of IT information technologies in, in supporting this and, um, and the, you know, just reading the industry uh, publications uh, every week. I see lots and lots of activity around limb systems and process automation and e increasingly even artificial intelligence and things like that. Where do you see the biggest opportunities for technology enabling how labs actually get this kind of work done? 
Yeah, you've picked on a personal passion of mine. So I was, uh, when I was working in the lab back in uh, 98, 99, I, I was the guy that they tabbed to uh, deal with the Y2K issues. So uh, I don't, I, I'm sure you remember that, Jason. I was I don't the know Y2K guy as well. But, uh, yeah, and, and, uh, and that really drew me into uh, my, my IT passion, you know, and tied it into the lab. And so I, I've been closely involved uh, with the IT uh, challenges related to lab and that, over the years, that's evolved as well, but uh, but uh, I think one one space is simply valid testing and validating your instruments and your software. As we as we grow, that becomes more and more important to make sure your instruments are doing what you expect them to be doing. But when we think about really enabling technologies uh, and and uh, technologies that have increased efficiency, uh, we see simply the the way that we record and track our data in the laboratories has uh, has grown significantly. Uh, not many labs these days are still writing things down on paper. Most of them have gone to electronic lab notebooks, limbs in, la in electronic lab notebooks and all that. Those are the those are the kind of obvious, right? Like, of course, you should be doing that. It's, you know, it's 2023. Can you imagine any lab not using electronic lab notebooks? Right. But uh, but now that we're in, in 2023, things that we think of are uh, big data. How do we leverage all this data we have? It's a trick in a bioanalytical lab because the data is owned by a lot of different people. But we have so much data, there, there must be a way to, to utilize that to improve uh, even if it's the assays we develop, right? Uh, so how do we leverage that data? And then how do we leverage AI uh, to, uh, to improve our bioanalytical work uh, that we do? And if it could help a scientist write a report uh, that they would edit, right? That they would get it right. But it just, it, it could save in so many ways. It could save so much time or, or, or can we have a uh, chat GPT for designing bioanalytical assays? I don't know what that is, but that ought to be, ought to, that's really doable, right? We just need to dump all this bioanalytical assay information, all this structural information into one AI and say, here's all the methods using these structures, make a method. And uh, I think I just figured out what the bioanalytical <laughs> team is going to do. Thanks, Jason. Well, <laughs> you're on one of my hot button issues, wow, obviously, yes. uh, analytics and data sciences. So, you know, we're, you and I are obviously fortunate enough to work in an industry that's, that's basically constantly focused right. on trying to improve the, yeah. the human condition. What are you most excited about in terms of the future of, uh, of life sciences? I'm excited more than anything else, uh, our capability to get more drugs to market faster. The 90s and the, in the early part of the 2000s, we got a lot of low-hanging fruit. We made a lot of progress, right? I mean, not, not that many people have heartburn anymore because we've got these great you know, proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole and pantoprazole, and I worked on a bunch of those. And, you know, but, but now the, the diseases that are left are hard, but they're the important ones. They're the ones that people really suffer from, right? We've seen tremendous progress in, in cancer treatment, but there's so much, so, so far to go. Uh, if we could really figure out how to efficient, efficiently develop cell and gene therapies uh, for uh, rare diseases, somebody, you know, where a person where maybe there's only 20 people in the world that have a disease and we could come up with a cure and, and deliver that to them. Wow. I mean, I think that's going to happen in our lifetime. Uh, I don't know if I would have said 10 years ago that was going to happen in our lifetime. I think that'll happen in mine in your lifetime at where we're going to get there. And, and I plan to be a big part of it. And it's cures, actually. That's the other thing. So when I, when I brought up heartburn, right, I, I take uh, omeprazole or I, actually I take whatever I find around because they all work for me. But, but those are just treating symptoms. But when we talk about uh, gene therapies, they're actually cures. They're actually uh, changing how your body reads out to fight a disease in a permanent way. So to really cure disease instead of just find new ways to treat symptoms, that, that's, that's awesome. That's, you know, that gets me excited. That makes me want to run out of this interview and, <laughs> and go, go work on some AI to develop some better assays so that we can you know, do our part to make that happen faster. Well, yeah. do it and, uh, and come back and we'll talk about it some more. All right, fantastic. <laughs> Chad, thanks yeah. so much for Thank taking you. the time to spend yeah. with us. Um, if folks want to know more about uh, Solarion, uh, they can go to Solarion's website, which is C-E-L-E-R-I-O-N.com, Solarion.com. Thanks a lot, Chad. Yeah, yeah thanks, Jason. Yeah.